Howdy folks, hope you're all having a good one, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. We have a nice, sort of casual, leisurely battle for you today, because when the ship that you're featuring is a, the USS Vermont, there's no other kind of battle. This is not a ship that does anything in a hurry. Sailing the Vermont for us today, it, I can't say his name with a straight face, <laughs> it's, is I Came On Your Broadside. I'm sure I've featured him before, because I've definitely seen that name. Um, but whichever battle it was, I can't remember. So, to lay a bit of groundwork for exactly what it is that you're seeing here. This is a clan battle. And Broadside here, and his buddy in the Napoli, Alimony Payment, that's another good name. <laughs> uh, they've joined this clan as mercenaries. They don't actually belong to the clan, but the clan needed a couple of warm bodies to make up the numbers for the next battle. And so these two guys volunteered. So, it's clan battle. It's domination mode, and we're here on the shattered map. So, it's customary at this point in the battle for me to spend a bit of time talking about the ship that our hero is sailing. I'm going to have plenty of time to do that today, because the Vermont is slow. This is the culmination in what were known as Tillman Project battleships. With the Tillman in question being a US Senator who started sticking his nose into the Navy's business in, I think, the 1920s and insisting that the US Navy develop ships like this. They're, they're basically the ultimate expression of what the US Navy called their standard class battleships. Ships like the New Mexico, the Arizona, the Colorado. Big, slow, fat, ugly battle wagons with lots and lots and lots of guns. These are the kind of ships that the US Navy was using in the First World War and beyond up to the Second World War. The design was firmly rooted in the past and then in the Second World War the US Navy decided actually screw this noise. Fast battleships are the way to go even though arguably the sun had already set on the whole battleship concept with the rise of the aircraft carrier. Um, but they started building fast battleships like the North Carolinas and the Iowas. The origins of these Tillman Project battleships, however, were firmly rooted in 1920s design philosophy. Hello, Puerto Rico. Say hello to my, well, not very little friends. This thing has 12 18-inch guns. Wow, that was disappointing. What did happen to the Mosfer's health? I didn't even see what hit him. Hang on a minute, gearing. You know the Puerto Rico has got radar, right? Hmm, yeah. Oh, right. I was going to say that it's okay, he might be safe, because radar cruisers don't normally use their radar unless they can actually shoot at the target, but, well, the Des Moines can. <laughs> yeah, that guy. And you don't want... To oh, wow, look at the crossfire. He's caught... Wow, look what is hitting the Mosfer. Holy shit. Okay, right, well, it was the Summers Torpedoes that finished him. Battleship Moskva just became Submarine Moskva. And the gearing over there, if he's not bloody careful, is very likely to be next. I think he just got radared by the Des Moines. Because if the Puerto Rico wasn't in a position to shoot at the gearing, he's unlikely to use his own radar. So the gearing took a big old slap from the Des Moines. It looks like the Des Moines radar expired, and the gearing now thinks he's safe inside a smokescreen. Useful hit there against the Des Moines, knocked out a gun turret. Don't think that's going to save the gearing, though, because the Puerto Rico is also a radar cruiser. And he's just cleared the island. And given the fact that he's shooting into a smokescreen and scoring hits, leads me to believe that he's just popped his own radar. And it's taken this long for the gearing, who really should have taken the hint at least a minute ago, to realise that he is up shit creek without a paddle and he's probably not going to survive to get out of there. Yep, he's... wow. I mean, I saw that one coming. I mean, it seemed kind of obvious to me what was going to happen there, but well, I, mean, I guess not everybody knows exactly which ship does and doesn't have radar. Although the fact that you're sailing a tier 10 destroyer and haven't yet figured out what the radar threat is... Ah oh, well, anyway. Maybe next time. Well, the demise of the gearing and the Moskva 
both of which looked entirely avoidable. Uh, that just leaves alimony payment over there in the Napoli. And I came on your broadside here in the Vermont against the Des Moines, the Puerto Rico, and let's not forget the Summers. The good news is the friendly Annapolis has just chalked up the team's first kill. Both teams have one cap circle. And with the Napoli, I mean, he's probably not intending to take the cap because he's going to need to keep moving or fall victim to torpedoes from the Summers. But with both enemy radars on cooldown, he is able to take advantage of the gearing smokescreen. Oh, and they've just lost the Annapolis. Oh well. Anyway, back to the Vermont. You've probably noticed that this thing is really, really slow. It has a top speed of 23 knots. Yeah, that much. But unless it's been sailing in a straight line for at least 30 seconds, which is not something that you want to do when there's a destroyer around launching torpedoes at you, unless this thing has been sailing in a straight line for at least 30 seconds, it's never going to see 23 knots. He definitely needs to get some solid island cover between himself and the Summers. And if he could land some shots on that Puerto Rico that weren't over pens, that would be really nice as well. Nope, not tonight, Josephine. Maybe the rear turret. Very, very good. Wow. Okay, that was better, but still not good enough. If those two over pens had been penetrations, the Puerto Rico would be dead, but they weren't, so it isn't. And yeah, he is kind of caught in a crossfire here, but he kind of doesn't have a lot of choice. He must keep moving or he's going to be torpedo bait for the Summers. If he can, come on, kill the Puerto Rico, or at the very least force it back into cover. Then he only has to worry about the Des Moines and the Summers that is almost certainly catching up with him. Nope. Looks like the Puerto Rico is going to live if not to fight another day, but at least for the next couple of minutes. He's now got a double fire. It's really disappointing because the Vermont doesn't have an awful lot going for it other than its firepower. This thing, in theory, should be able to bring a colossal weight of fire to bear on the target with 12 18-inch guns. Sadly, not 18.2-inch, like the Yamato, for example, which can overmatch 32mm of battleship plating. But these guns can definitely smash through the bows of a cruiser, like the Des Moines, and potentially citadel it from the front. And with the Puerto Rico tucked in behind the island, licking its wounds, he doesn't have an awful lot of choices. Torpedoes Again, behind. disappointing hits. Oh, yeah, looks like the Summers has caught up enough to get some torpedoes away. He's keeping those rear Torpedoes turrets behind. for just in case the Puerto Rico oh, thinks, oh, I've got his broadside now, let's pop out and try our luck. But while he's doing that, and while he can't really manoeuvre as he bends over, puts his head between his legs and prepares to kiss his ass goodbye with all these torpedoes coming in, uh, he's not able to bring an awful lot of fire to bear on the Des Moines. He can but hope that the Puerto Rico, which has managed to recover some health, is going to think, come on, let's have you. He's managed to take the cap circle. With the help of the Napoli, of course, captain by alimony payment. Our ship is aflame. They really need to start sinking some ships. I mean, the weight of fire that they can bring them, and it looks like the uh, the Summers is now shooting at them from stealth. Landing a couple of hits on the Napoli. Meanwhile, I came in your broadside. He knows the Puerto Rico's there. He knows it's only a matter of time before the Puerto Rico thinks, I have to help out the Des Moines. And I've got the broadside of a couple of ships here to shoot at. And this is exactly what he was waiting for. He's only got the rear turrets, but those are, seriously, more overpens. How troll is the armour on that thing? That might end up costing the Napoli. Yep, I think it is. Well, he's finally managed to get the Puerto Rico. The Napoli manages to get the Des Moines, but with 141 health and a fire, yeah. The good news is they've taken the cap circle. This is the team's second cap. They've also managed to deal with the Des Moines and the Puerto Rico. Unfortunately, very unfortunately, for I came in your broadside in a big slow ass battleship like this, they weren't able to deal with the Summers. And that's going to be a big old problem. He is in shooting range of the St. Vincent. And the St. Vincent is almost certainly not in shooting range of him and actually has Shimakaze problems of his own. 
because they're the only two ships surviving. Broadside here in the Vermont and the Shemakazi over there. Hopefully the Shemakazi can look after himself and isn't going to be dumb enough to get himself spotted by a battle cruiser, because he's easily going to outspot him. And while he should also be able to outspot the Summers, not by that big of a margin. And based on the fact that somebody has just flipped the cap circle at Bravo, and it's not the St. Vincent, that's going to be, well, it's good news for Broadside here because he's no longer being pursued by the Summers, but it's really bad news for the Shimakaze. I can only hope he's been paying attention to the cap circles. Speaking of cap circles, the slowest ship in the world here. <laughs> Slowy McSlowface, the USS Vermont, just flipped the cap circle at Alpha, and he's now taken a leisurely stroll now that he's no longer being pursued by the Summers, in the direction of the cap circle at Charlie. In a few minutes, he might even get to see it. In a few minutes more, he might get to flip it. As long as the Summers, which we don't know if yet he is, he's just popped up. The Summers has just found himself the Shimakaze. Now, the thing about the Shimakaze, and I do keep saying this about Japanese torpedo destroyers, is, well, they are by no means gunships. Their guns do hit kind of hard. They just don't hit very often. They've got a long-ass reload and very slow turret traverse. But of the Japanese torpedo destroyers, the Shimakaze probably has the best guns. Oh, lordy, look at that. <laughs> okay. He managed to thread the needle between the torpedoes. But in doing so, he's going the wrong way. I mean, he didn't have a lot of choice. He couldn't turn around. Or he would have eaten torpedoes. And while he can hit the Summers hard, the, the Summers can hit him a lot more often. Oh, no. Oh, this is really, really bad. Yep, yeah, he's dead. Oh, uh, well, never mind. This is disastrously bad news for I came on your broadside in Slowy McSlowface here. For reasons that should be obvious, but I'm going to explain them anyway. He's the last ship left alive on his team on 50% health against the Tier 10 battlecruiser with some fairly substantial firepower of its own, although it doesn't have the same weight of fire as the Vermonts, but still not an insignificant threat. It is, of course, faster than the Vermont, but, well, you know, that's not exactly much of a surprise, is it? A one-legged retired Spanish footballer is faster than the Vermont in a foot race. Um, and also, of course, outspots the Vermont. But this, the biggest threat is obviously the Summers. So the big question on Broadside's mind here has to be, what is the Summers going to do? As he manages to slip into and hopefully flip, or at the very least contest and stop the enemy team from gaining any more points from it, his second cap circle of the battle. The enemy team are about 150 points ahead. However, there's still seven minutes of this battle left. So... This is not one of those classic Game of Thrones situations where the enemy team are ahead on points. All they have to do to win is run, hide, run the timer out and take the points win. That's not going to happen. Not now that Broadside has taken two of the caps and in the amount of time remaining is easily going to overhaul the enemy team's points total. They do actually have to kill him. Or at the very least flip one of the other cap circles. Likewise, this is also not one of those situations where Broadside can afford to turn around and run and wait the timer out because, well, he's in Slowy McSlowface and this thing doesn't run away from anything. They will easily catch him and kill him. And two, with the enemy team at the moment 100 points ahead and over 900 points, all they have to do to win, if he tries to do that, is... Well, they don't even have to take one of the cap circles. Simply contesting it will be enough. So running away is not really an option. And choosing the fight is extremely risky because both of these enemy ships outrun him, outspot him, and out-torpedo him. It's all going to come down to what the Summers is choosing to do. And it's fairly obvious which way he's going to be coming because they've seen him flip the cap circle at Charlie. And this thing is slow. It can't afford to take the scenic route to get to the cap circle at Bravo. 
So the smart money would be on preparing an ambush for him right about here. And it doesn't even matter if the Summers dies when launching a torpedo ambush. All he has to do is get the torpedoes away. And it wins because the St. Vincent is still alive. But then somebody starts flipping the cap circle behind us at Charlie. Probably not the St. Vincent. All right, Summers, let's see what you're doing. Yeah, this is bad news. Or it would be if the St. Vincent hadn't forgotten that he's not a battleship. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Battle of Jutland all over again. <laughs> you might have battleship guns, but you don't have battleship armour. And that has put broadside ahead on points. But the Summers has flipped the cap circle at Charlie, and they're now getting more points coming in. But, oh, look at this. Here's the cap circle at Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> and since he's ahead on points, he doesn't even have to flip this cap circle. Both teams only have points coming in from one cap circle each. This is a win. 993 points. No, there's the summers. Day late and a dollar short, sunshine. <laughs> I mean, you have to give them points for trying. Uh, metaphorical points, of course, not actual points. Because I came when your broadside reaches a thousand points first, thanks to that severe miscalculation uh, from, well, definitely the St. Vincent, technically the Summers too. Uh, and that's a win. And I did not see that one coming. Uh, it's a clan battle, of course, so everybody on the winning team gets two and a half thousand points. Everybody on the losing team gets 250. But yeah, you, you just watched the slowest ship in the world, not actually the slowest ship in the world, but whatever, it's my video, flip not one, not two, but three gap circles, three more than any of the destroyers on the team, and win. And on that bombshell, <laughs> that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.